Feeling oh, like a bad bad. Yeah. <laughs> this, right, is this is it. Oh right. We're on. <laughs> <laughs> Where's me tea, mother? Right. Right. Serious face. Welcome back to Nobody's Garage. Right, this is going to be the first episode, the pilot episode, if you like, of Delwood's Garage Q&A. A sensible attempt to put um, questions answered for you so that you can help fix your own bikes, keep things safe and save a few bob. Um, and in the process, we aim, aim to have a laugh, don't we? <laughs> it's mandatory. It's mandatory, apparently. So we have all the ingredients we need. We have your questions ready. We have tea. Have you got tea? Tea. Tea. Right, ready to go. Okay, so just some introductions first. As compare for this afternoon, we have the lovely one and only Penny Pitsop. And as special guest, the person, because obviously for the q and I needed someone with a brain, someone who actually knows what they're talking about. He wasn't available. He wasn't available, so <laughs> we've enlisted the help of the one and only Mr. Duke Dyson. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, now, as you can see, Penny has a bell here. This is uh, the waffle alert. Thanks, Ron. Obviously, things do tend to descend into waffle with us, uh, so if we seem to be waffling at any point, Penny has, <laughs> Penny has got the waffle alert, and we'll get them round the head. <laughs> Ooh, do I get to keep it? Yeah, you should have done that, you've got fucking idiot now. Have you got lots? <laughs> you might be a bit full by the end of the day. Yeah, well, right, okay, right, Penny. And the first question right, is... I've got loads of questions. Loads, loads of questions. questions. We've got about 60. And we've had to we'll whittle them down. As we can. Yeah, we've had to whittle them down to the ones that need um, answers the most, and after that, we'll fit in as many as we can. Are we ready? We're oh, ready. Right. Dun, dun, dun. right. First up, George Nutton. Hi, George. He says, "I own a '92 Kawasaki KH125. Is it normal to find bits of swarf on the tip of the spark plug?" Right. A bit of swarf on the tip of the spark plug. <laughs> I reckon it's not normal to find that, my mate. Um, I reckon that you've probably got a bit of a thread damage on the thread in the cylinder head. So take the plug out and have a close look with the torch down inside that plug hole and see if there's any damage to that thread. Sometimes they get over tightened and that can damage the thread. And if it is, you might need to have it helicoiled and repaired, wouldn't you say? I should think so, yep. And when you do the new one up, don't do it up too tightly because that will do it again. Mm -hmm. So what's the next one? Uh, Paul Waring, number one, he says, where did you get the indicator resistors from project damage? Uh, are they any good? Yep. Right, they are those little gold anodized um, resistors. They came from a place called More Speed. More Speed, if you look them up, just Google it's M O M O O R E. Speed. Yeah. Yep. More Speed <coughs> Racing. If you look them up, they're a company in Bournemouth and they sell all that kind of thing online. You can just buy them. They were £10 each and they are brilliant. Um, they're, they're a kind of, for motorcycles, they're kind of a show part. Uh, that, well, it is worth bearing in mind that you can get ones that are like a ceramic case rather than yeah. that rather than that um, die cast one, but avoid them if you can, because that um, die cast affair is actually acting as a heat sink. So they're the ones hot. to go for. You know, the heat that's um, generated within the resistor is dissipated yeah. away. Yeah, but they're a good piece of kit. They've never let me down, and the indicators on the old pile they're still working fine. I need to go to the second part. Right. He says he has a uh, ZX9R Ninja. Right. 99, carries a small pillion every now and again, and she has a problem getting her leg over. <laughs> Rohit <Rohypnol. laughs> I knew that you were going to do that. <laughs> Rohit no. Works for me every Rohypnol, time. Rohit no, mate. No worries. Just <laughs> see her over the back and strap her on. Um, Have you got any advice on lowering, but not too much? And that would be cool. What, lowering your girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> Get some shortage down, right. right? Seriously now? Seriously, yeah. Seriously? Right, what, what do you reckon? Well, I, I would suggest, um, as, as counterintuitive as it seems, rather than lowering the bike, I would lower the pillion pegs to make it easier for, I'm assuming it's a her, or oh, well, yeah. Yeah. huge assumption, that could get me in all sorts of trouble, but, <clears throat> but it would make it easier to, to get one foot on the peg, swing the other leg over the bike if the pegs were a little bit lower. Yeah. Um, lowering kits are readily available. Yeah, get dog bones, mate. eBay is your friend. That's it. Yeah, get some dog bones. I would consider lowering the pegs first, because if you lower the bike, you lose ground clearance and that, that impedes riding of the bike. So there's a couple of options, um, as a quick one option, what I used to do with you when we had the Hayabusa, is park next to a kerb. When she comes to get on, if you pull the bike up next to a kerb, the foot peg is the height of the kerb lower to where she's standing, so it's a lot easier to get on and off. Uh, so there's loads of options, lower the bike or lower the pegs, mate. Right, next question is from Absolute Scoot, and he says, is it possible to retrofit ABS and ASR? 
You know that one? Um, how do I answer that politely? Without wishing to sound too condescending? Um, no. No, <laughs> you can't. I, I you will, could, you I, will, could. I, will, I will qualify that slightly and say, yes it is, but it's such it. a work up. You, you wouldn't really want to do it. For the benefits you're going to gain, it's really not worth the aggravation. It is, it's not as simple as taking one braking system off and sticking another braking system on. There's far more to it. Yeah, you've got the electronics that fire the system. You've got to wire it into the loom. Yeah. You? Um, and the other side of it is, again, why would you want to do it? Why do you want ABS anyway? It's you, yeah, you want to consider, I mean, the kind of stuff you're having on your bike. I mean, if you go on to own a bike that's got ABS, yeah, fine, but <clears throat> that kind of stuff should be supplementing your riding, not substituting yeah. Your ability to ride. Yeah. Get out there, put some miles under, under the wheels. The other side of it as well is that it is ABS, and if you make a mistake in fitting it, and you do it wrong, you make one error, and it doesn't work, or it causes a problem, you're messing around with your braking, and you're taking a huge risk. So as long as you feel competent in doing it, then it's a case that there's no kits, though, is there? Not that I'm well, I've never heard of a kit. Of a kit um, so you'd have to go and find another bike that's got it and rip it off and then fit it on from there. Which, which means your buying kit from Breakers Yards, you, know, it you don't good? know its provenance. No, I, I, would, I would avoid it. By all means, buy a bike with ABS, but, but I wouldn't consider retrofitting it. No. I'll that one. <laughs> Next. Uh, Addy, 11000. I'll probably say that completely wrong. Are bar end weights necessary? I had one fall off a Honda 1000 a while ago and it took me four days to replace it. Because it, it was buried in some place for it. Had to get it out of the car's windscreen behind. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. Sorry, sorry. And in Moving that time, right. I've never noticed any changes in handling or excess vibration. And at 19 quid to replace it, I wonder what I should do. Spend the 19 quid. I would. The principle is, mate, the bar weights make the bars heavier. The fact you put them out on the end of the bars, they make the headstock heavier. And you may not have noticed any difference in that four days, but honestly, if you came out of a bend, nailed the power on, then you'll feel it. Because as the front end goes light, you start to get a little shimmy, and that can develop into a nasty tank slapper. Bar weights are also about vibration. Comfort. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Comfort. White yeah. fingers. Yep, yeah, 70 mile an hour, constant for hour after hour. If you're going up the motorway somewhere, doing a bit of touring, you will get a very slight vibration in the bars. Just a buzz, isn't it? The weight of, a bar, of the bar end weights will, uh, it changes the resonance at which that frequency occurs, so you don't feel it in your normal realm of, uh, of riding. So it saves tingly so fingers. Fingers going white and obviously getting cold. But if you don't want them on, you can, you can fit steering damper, can't you? You can, and I have heard, I don't know how successful it is, so don't quote me on this, but I have heard people packing their handlebars with lead shot as well. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. Um, but you need some weight in the end, that's what it's about, mm. and that just damps it all out. And if your bike's got a steering damper, you probably didn't notice it for that reason. Some bikes had both, the high booster did, that had bar weights and a damper, which yeah. is kind of belt and braces. Yeah, my, so you may not have felt it, because you don't have the damper. If you want to just experiment and find out what they're for and how they work, Take them off, and if you've got a steering damper, disconnect it, then go for a ride. And you, you'll certainly feel it then. I you might want to phone A&E first. Yeah. <laughs> ride towards the hospital and you'll get closer all the time. Right, next. next question. Brother Monk, we'd like to know about your early biking years, your first bike, and how you learned about the mechanics. Oh, I was trying, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I had a trying, yeah. yeah. Had you probably had a penny farthing. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Right, um, first bike, Fizzy, FS1, Yamaha FS1e, which I rode on the road at 16. Um, before that, a mate of mine, me and a mate called Damien, we bought a Vespa 125 from a neighbour that had no handlebars because he dropped it and broke them. Well, and the neighbour had no handlebars. Neighbour had no handlebars, no. He was the same boat with short legs. And a bar in weight. And a bar in weight in his forehead. <laughs> but we, we put it back together, we sold it for a profit, and I put the money towards my Fizzy. Uh, so, like so many people in, this, in the early 80s, I had a fizzy way, mate. Uh, my first bike was a 1958 Norman B2S. Yes, that's Norman, <laughs> as in as in slightly dull bloke. Brought tank, here by the French <laughs> Army. <laughs> tank top, brown course. Yeah. Norman. <laughs> Which was a, a 200cc Villiers two-stroke. Um, Seven horsepower. Uh, yeah, about that, yeah. And that actually was where I started learning about the ins and outs of the inside of bikes. Cause, uh, well, you need to then. Because you needed to. <laughs> it, it, it was, uh, so evenings were spent round my backyard or friends' backyards, taking bikes apart. Um, yeah, that was like you, sold mine for a profit, and that was ploughed into a Kawasaki Z200, which I was, Whoa. which is what I had the L plate flapping on the back of. 60 horsepower of me, yeah. yeah. What about you, Penny? What was your first bike? 
350 LC. RD 350, what hooligan? It's the wheelie, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. I do regret telling you how to do wheelies. <laughs> it wasn't my better decision. I mean, it just about got Can't away with it. Can't do it on the Harley anymore. Can't do it on the Harley, you could. Well, I could. Maybe <laughs> you do. Maybe that's but how did you learn uh, about the mechanics and bikes? Oh, my granddad taught me lots of stuff. My granddad was brilliant. Um, he was very practical. He fixed everything himself uh, because he was born in 1918 and he was that generation. And what, what he taught me mostly wasn't things and how to do things and jobs and technical ability. It was a mentality. He instilled in me a mentality of how hard can it be. It's only things bolted or screwed or nailed together. Um, and if you break it, well, you can soon fix it because then you'll learn. And I think that was what it's about. It's learning the right mentality when you're young enough to start teaching yourself. And then 40 years later, you suddenly know quite a bit. What about you, mate? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, mine was more, more a peer group thing. You know, uh, myself and like minded friends in our teens would so, spend their spare time riding it, breaking it, fixing it. So, well, breaking it mostly. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. And me? So, what about you, Ben? Oh, that was Gary. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you don't know a lot. <laughs> Right. Well, next question. to the question so far, here we go. We've got Josh Smith. Can I put HID like kit on my bike? Is this the best way to increase headlight performance? He's got a CB 597 twin. Yeah, I'd say it is. I, I believe, I believe that I, I'm right in saying that you can fit an HID kit to pretty much anything. Um, anything with a 12 volt system, that is. I mean, if you've got a yeah. Honda Bentley or something with six volts, then <laughs> yeah, well, it just probably doesn't work. go fast enough to, need to see more than about no. three yards in front of the well, right. But, but it's, it provides you've got a 12 volt system, pretty yeah. much anything. anything. Although, although in the UK, it's worth commenting, strictly speaking, unless it's fitted from the factory as new, or your bike has self leveling suspension, which I don't know of any bike that has self leveling suspension. No, okay. Technically, it's an MOT failure, but but I don't know anybody oh, who's ever, ever presented a bike for MOT with an HID kit and it's failed. Oh, no, so. no, I put one on a Hayabusa and the guy in the MOT station loved it, so it was great because yeah. it only replaced the yeah. low beam. And they are a great system. They, they are, are a great good. system. They, they turn night into day. Brilliant. It doesn't, doesn't save you any energy. Don't fall into the thinking because it's LED style that it won't draw any current. It draws the same current as regular light. It just goes into like a coil and boosts it up. It's a big, yeah, they, they, there's the task, mate. On a bike that hasn't got a fairing, you have a task to hide that big open yeah, back box. Yeah, it's about the size of a backy tin, isn't it? It probably? is, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite big and effectively uh, it's got a bit yeah. of related wiring, but then that's the task for you, is yeah, to pack it. Yeah, you've got to lose that somewhere. Get it inside the headlight bucket or somewhere where it's not going to get wet. Right, ready? Um, Anthony White, I just added this one while you were getting prepared. Right, it's just coming a minute ago. Last minute. Right, Anthony. Uh, how easy is it to inspect or change the swing arm bearings? He's changed the steering wheel bearings on his 92 GSXR 750. But the bearings look like they might be a difficult game. It's the needle bearings, isn't it? Yeah. Um, they can be difficult. They can be. I mean, if, if you've already got a basic level of uh, mechanical competence, um, it's probably not a terribly difficult job. Um, does it say what the bike is? Uh, GSXR 750. GSXR 750. So, so you've you got no centre stand. You've got to hold it up first. Yeah. That uh, obviously it's, paddock stand is no good because you take no, the swing arm off. The, the workshop um, practices side of it's one half, isn't it? Yeah. But it's needle bearings, and they are a little bit difficult. They're, they're, they're different. They're not in your headstock bearings. You've got a standard taper roller, and it all's in one piece. Uh, it all in one piece. But with the needle rollers, they can all fall out in big heap. It's you know the sort of job I wouldn't bother even going near. If it, it was just for the sake of it, I'd it's un to... unusual for a for a sort of standard mileage well, bike. A ninety-two. Ninety-two. So what are we there? Twelve there? years old. So <coughs> it's odd that they've gone so soon, but then people jet wash bikes, don't they? they yeah. Power yeah. wash bikes, and that's what causes yeah. water to get in and corrodes them. I'd say. I mean, the answer to the question is, it's not difficult, my old mate. No. It's just a case of applying yeah. yourself, taking your time, looking at the job, and if you get stuck, drop us a line, isn't it? Yeah. Let us yeah. know. Yeah, I'd say. I mean, standard workshop practice applies, doesn't yeah. it? It's. Yeah, so just do it one bit by a time and get a manual if it helps. With but, like, but your first headache is going to be how you're going to support the bike. You yeah, go. get it off the ground because you've got to take the swing arm out. You've got nothing to stand it up, mm -hmm. and you've got no centre stand on a jigsaw. That's a kind of that's a that's a kind of answer, isn't it? Because you so can't really tell them how to do it. Some of these some of these questions they kind of more need an explanation, and we've got fit plenty in, yeah. so we will do our best on these. One day there might be a how-to on it. You never know. There might be. <laughs> But they might be in, they might not. Well, the bandits are getting older and more shagged out every day, so you never know, it might be shortly. Right, SK8ER131000. He always sends loads of questions, so, yeah. thank you. Right. 
Do you have any thoughts about fuel injected two strokes? Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Would it be uh, would be awesome to bring the two strokes back? It would, wouldn't it? I'm a big fan of two strokes. A huge yeah. fan of two strokes on yeah. two levels. One, there's a bit they're a bit of a hooligan machine, and I kind of like that. And two, I think there is a vast untapped potential there for two strokes. I, yeah. I think they they could potentially be the way forward, and a, and mm. a fuel injected two stroke for me would be cool. lovely. Yeah, it would. I think on the other side of it is as well. There's for for me the, what, what I see in that. As much as it would be lovely for reminiscent reasons, I see that when you look at today's motorcyclist, you look at the archetypal newbie coming into riding. They like a bit of touring. They like a bit of luggage. They like a bit of distance and pillion, and none of that fits with two-stroke, no. because two-strokes are not about torque. Two-stroke engines don't make any torque. You can get the same torque out of a, a four-stroke 125 as you do out of a 250 two-stroke. They're just a race engine. That's the point, isn't it? They're a yeah. screamer. They're a fun race engine. So for fun bikes, it could be a way to go for sports bikes, because MCN just put up a video asking the relevance of 1,000cc sports bikes, because yeah. they are becoming utterly pointless on the highway. And even on track days, they're pointless, because the 600s will ride by you, because yeah. yeah. they've got more usable power. So you could say, in the future, but like everything, it will all be led by racing. And two strokes were kicked off the racetracks 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. yeah. Never to return. I think if the emissions can be right, because let's face it, diesel engines used to be big, black, smoking mm. leviathans that made no horsepower. Look at them now. Every car out there is a diesel engine. You know, even these tiny little pop pops. Yeah. I think there's a diesel smart now, aren't there? Well, Honda did make a prototype two stroke fuel injected car engine, right. which was. Travel got there first. Though. Yeah, well, yeah, quite, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's clean emissions. That's clean it? emissions. <coughs> Good uh, Russian emissions. The Honda system was pretty much the bee's knees, but for whatever reason, I don't know, they didn't pursue it. No. But um, but the potential, the potential certainly is there. Yeah, the technology's there. It's just the need. Whether or not customers in a in a bike shop would buy a two-stroke bike, and when you look at the the all the bike dealers will tell you today that global sales of super bikes are down. What people are buying is retro bikes straight handlebar bikes, so it'd be kind of street fighter stuff, wouldn't it? Yeah. Things like the Brutale are coming on, aren't they? Amazing stunt bikes, or the Supermotos. Now that'd be cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. To see that. KTM might even go there with that, but who knows? Yeah, the sort of person that would. They yeah. would, yeah. <laughs> First waffle of that. <laughs> shut up. Yeah, shut up. Right. One down. <laughs> I'll drink some of me tea, shut up. Uh, right, next question. Vibs Ford, Vic, says, question for you. The majority of tyres will be okay normal riding on a dry road, but the big one is what tyres work best, especially cornering on a wet road Question. or mm. a cold wet road, and still give reasonable mileage. Cool. Um, cold wet road. Or any, any warm wet roads. Yeah. And maybe in Bob Agos. <laughs> right, I, I'll, I'll kick in with that and say I've used the old Avon Storm 2. Mm. I've gone through four sets of them on the Bandit since before I put the novels on, and they're brilliant. They've got big, wide, deep grooves. They're not expensive. I paid about probably 180 quid for a pair fitted to loose rims, and they lasted about 6,000 miles on the, on the back and about eight on the front. Mm. And I changed them as a pair, so they're, they're quite cool. about you, mate? Um, well, my, my, both my bikes run um, Michelin Pilot Road 3s now. Um, I see they. they are, well, I ride all year round, so I do a lot, of, a lot of wet, a lot of cold, a little bit of icy and all the rest of it. And there's no doubt about it, in my opinion, that they are fantastic in the wet. Really, really fantastic. <clears throat> good lifespan out of them. Um, the ones on the SV currently are on about 8,000 miles, and they look pretty good. The downside is they are seriously expensive. Mm. Uh, I think I paid about 100 and, 140 quid for a rear, yeah. 120 for a front. Um, and the other downside is you, you, you want to be honest with yourself about the kind of miles you're doing. I mean, if you're doing, if you are genuinely riding all year round, they're really, really great. If you're doing a little bit in a little bit of wet, I don't think they're worth the extra money because although they are fantastic in the wet, yeah. they're not all that in the dry. No. Well, I think um, the problem is wet tyres have to be soft. Yeah. That's yeah. the natural part of it. And soft tyres don't last long. So it's always a balance, yeah. isn't it? So I mean, they, do, they do exploit this multiple compound affair whereby mm. the, the, the centre of the tyre is is That's a harder compound, Dual compound to, like to give you a, a, a greater sort of you know longevity. Yeah. <clears throat> the outside is a softer compound to give you the better grip. Yeah. Um, so they do exploit that. But I tell you what I've yeah. seen a lot because um, I used to like the Shinkos, the old Cheng Shin, mm. years ago because they were buttons. You could buy a pair for eighty quid, and if they didn't last, it didn't yeah. matter. They're good for burnouts. The other side of it is they've they've been replaced. What's the word? Hang on. Ones with the diamond cut on the edge. What Maxis? Yeah, Maxxis diamonds. Mm. Yeah, I've heard a lot. I haven't used them. I've heard a lot about Maxxis diamonds. The edge tread is all diamond cut and etched. Yeah. They look really good. Well, watch this space because that's what's going on the SV3000 really? next. Yeah. Oh, there you go. There you go. So we'll, um, we'll report back on them. Cool. And, and his second part of his question, 
pun puncture safe looks good on tubeless tyres, would it work on tube tyres? <laughs> <laughs> you can answer that one. You can answer on your that, yeah. with the spokes. Go on, tell them what happened. We we had a puncture, didn't we? Got a I got down, chipboard screw, wasn't it? Oh, 40 miles, 40, 50 miles from home. Uh, puncture in the back of the Harley. Big chipboard screw. Ooh, just what you need. And, Some lovely um, Harley only come over. What did he do? He gave us a big tin of expanding foam. He said, put this in. So he thought, well, we've got 50, 60 miles to get home. So put it in. Thought we'd get it down to the fuel station, get some air pumped in. Got halfway to the petrol station, and there's all this <coughs> stuff oozing out all of my it's like, spokes. It's like fountains <laughs> coming out of spoke coming holes. Coming out everywhere. So no. So no, mate. It you doesn't can't. work. It has to be a tubeless tyre because the the um, the tube itself, the, the the soft rubber tube, your inner tube, which has got the puncher, it isn't thick enough to hold a plug of anything that's going to set. It's so thin it just allows it out. So no matter. Actually, that was a good good day because it it. Well, funny day. Not it was, funny. It actually. wasn't a good day. It was a long day. <laughs> it was 34 degrees. It was. It was. The it was breakdown good. recovery people were going to be six hours. Yeah. So we we just. We went to a B and Q, didn't we? <laughs> Bought a foot pump. Bought a foot pump. And it was four hours. Pumped it up, rode a bit. Riding 15, 15 oh, miles. God. Stopping, pumping it back up. Right? <laughs> Go. But, but the 15 miles was ridden at five miles an hour. <laughs> And we got home. I was getting bit by everyone. <laughs> Be here, get off the road. What are you doing? That was loads of fun, wasn't it? Right. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> Touche. See you, my man. Right. Uh, right, next one from the USA. Moving S. Right along. Lee says um, In the US, they put alcohol in gasoline. Don't know what it's like there. Send you blind. Yeah. It does, yeah. Makes you look very drunk. <laughs> In the winter, I'm finding the tank may last several weeks. Is there a safe additive or method to treat this? And also, if I bought two 10-gallon cans and decided to keep my own alcohol-free gas storage, how can I? How long can I safely store this? Well, I watched the cop, uh, an episode. This I know exactly what you're saying, mate, because I watched an episode of Hot Rod Roadkill recently, where um, Freiberger and Finnegan were talking about fuel and that they go and rescue an old hot rod that's been in a barn for 30 years and the fuel that remains in the float bowls of the big holly carb would be fine once they put a new battery on it to fire it up and it would drive home on it 30 odd year old fuel and yet today you put modern gasoline in an engine and three months later it's knackered so it's, it's changed a great deal and there are stabilizers aren't there there you are stabilizers you buy additives to put in uh, but i think they only extend it a bit don't they? yeah i think you well, I, well, you're I, meant to put that in just before you use before it. Before you use it's it, a, yeah. it's an octane booster. Oh, isn't I, mean, it? I mean, I know there are some differences between UK fuel and US fuel. Um, Price, mate. But yeah, 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 a bit of that. <laughs> nine nine dollars a gallon we pay. But I mean, oh, I, you, you work, you're working on a sort of a, um, a benchmark of three months. If you've got stored fuel for three months, it's probably junk. Yeah. Does that's it also not depend where you're storing this? Because we're not allowed to store fuel here. Yeah, no, good point. No, that's right. Yeah. That five gallons is the limit in the UK. Yeah. Um, and again, it has to be in a specific type of um, yeah. container. Yeah, I mean, it's laws to one side. Just think about the principles of leaving 20 gallons of high explosive fuel. Um, Don't leave your, it under your bed. Yeah, probably under your bed, eh? Or in your pantry. Keep yeah. calling yeah. it, wouldn't it? Yeah. But you can imagine. Or in the microwave. <laughs> in the microwave. <laughs> no, warm it up a bit. Bing! <laughs> So no mate, I would say that um, if you're stuck, it's I'd say... It's a personal decision. It's a personal we decision, so but it. he hasn't asked whether it's safe or not. No, what he's asked is, will it's it safe? I know what you're saying though, some Harley's like 48 with a daft, daft little two gallon tank. What I might be looking into, if you've got a 48, is perhaps carrying some supplementary fuel. Yeah. If you've got a one of those really cool um, sort of bobber side bags, which go on the left hand side of your Harley, you can get two one litre fuel flasks in there. And that's a great way on those little bikes to extend your mileage from about 60 miles to sort of a good 120, which makes a difference. Um, but I'd say as for additives, and not it's whether you can buy them, you're going to need to look at your market, mate, yeah. and see if fuel stabilisers are available. And when you do fit them, you put them in the fuel once you're going to use it. You don't put them in, then leave them. They're not storage thing, are they? I don't think so, no. I mean, they are an additive to, to the fuel yeah. for its use. Yeah. Yeah. But, so. And check out the environment you're going to keep them in. If it's a very cold environment and they're steel cans, you can get rust in the cans and all sorts. Yeah, I mean, that's something else again, isn't it? I mean, containers, particularly steel containers, you want to keep them as full as possible so you don't yeah. get condensation. Jerry cans, the only way, really. Jerry cans steel jerry cans, yeah, steel jerry cans is best, yeah. yeah. Next. Ready? Uh, Joachim van Leeuwen, I hope hey, I well pronounced said. that right. <laughs> You're posh, have you been on the news and everything? <laughs> Say that again. Joachim van Leeuwen. 
That's so cool, isn't it? I'm going to change my name to that. Yeah, I think so. That's a cool name. Yeah. Well done. You have the coolest name in the world, sir. <laughs> He, he asks, uh, is a premium brand half synthetic oil worth the price or is the cheap stuff fine as well? I'm going to let you answer that in its entirety because I know you have an opinion on this. <laughs> well, personally, <laughs> I'd say that it's, it's a simple answer to it. There's a bit of noise, by the way, it's a heater because it's, it it's about three degrees outside yeah. and it's only about four in here. It's only warmed up by the warmth of Penny's personality, so we're going we're gonna to add a bit of heat to it. So sorry if there's a bit of rushing noise. Um, it is that. Now, with the oil, I'd say if your oil is going to be something you use in an old engine, you're going to change it every three or 4,000 miles, then I'd say you're absolutely fine to use a cheap oil. But the other side of it is all about the sheer strength. It's what your engine does. If you need a basic 1040 for something like a Bandit or a Harley, it's just a tractor engine, isn't it? Yeah. It's fine. It'll be okay with a cheaper oil. If, on the other hand, you have an R6 or, or a Brutale or a Ducati or something that does bizarre revs, uh, at 15, 17,000 revs, then you really do need the best possible oil you can. So it's horses for courses, my friend. And the only question I would say is, I'll leave the question open to you, how much are you saving? Does it matter? How much do you love your baby? At the end of the day, my bike, Penny's bike, and I'm saying, sure the same as with your bike, they mean everything to us. Yes. And if, if it's the Bandit, it gets, one of the can is now, cheapo, Euro car parts, four pound a gallon rubbish, but I change it every 3,000 miles. With the others, they get the highest spec I can afford to put in them. With pennies, we use um, Harley Syntec 3, don't we? Which is just a better oil. Um, I even like Mobile One. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. It does it all. Yeah. Um, it, it's a 040 viscosity, so yeah. it's as thin as it needs to be in, in the cold weather, which is you know this time of year. And so it's, it's, a, it's that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I use Castrol 42 in the SV1000 because it gets pampered. And I'll use Halford's own brand cheap nasty in the TDM. Is it from Aldi? Because, because it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> from from well, Iceland. He shot at Aldi. He shot at Aldi. Well, it gets changed quite regularly because most of it goes out of the exhaust anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, can I add, there well, are other supermarkets. There are, yeah, there are other, other supermarkets other brands available. Yeah. Devil's Garage would not like to particularly prefer any particular <laughs> supermarket. So what is that? Is that, is that the rest of the question? That's it, thank you. That's Hope it. That cool. So yeah, cheap, cheap oil in a cheap old banger. Uh, if you've got a nice bike, why, why, why not treat it? Next question. This is from New Zealand. Uh, Stu, Brian Full. Stu. Uh, Stu. What is the best way to jack up a bike with no external frame? He's got a 250cc jack bike, but the engine is part of the frame. Right. Thanks, Stu. Without the use of a sky hook and a winch, you are buggered. But there is an option, real mate. What I tend to do with any bike that's not no main stand is you can use the side stand. You put a trolley jack under the right hand side of the bike, and then you jack against the side stand. So you jack the right hand side of the bike up and the bike tips over. Now if you put the jack behind the side stand, the rear wheel will come up. If you put it in front of where the side stand is, the front wheel will come up. And all you need to do is jack against the underneath. If you've got four, uh, the well, it's not four is it? Ooh, not a 250, it'd be a twin wouldn't it? It'd be a twin probably. So the, the downpipes are sometimes good, but if you can get to a solid bit of engine, use a block of wood. I did have it here. There's a little block of wood somewhere. Just get a little block of wood with a sponge on it, and then just that will be nice and soft, and just gently jack against it. The other trick, if it's for doing your tyre, is get your mate to do it, isn't it? Pull it against yes, it. Yes, yeah. So on your side stand, get your mate to stand on the side stand side, and pull the bike by the back, and it will lift the back wheel up. It's only a 250. So it is difficult, my old mate, um, even out by paddock stands. Yeah, I mean, for routine stuff, I mean, chain adjustment, that kind of thing, um, paddock stand. Yeah. Um, Cheap now. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're, uh, what, 25 quid a wire? Paddock stand? Yeah, get yeah. paddock stand for it. If, you can get yeah. front paddock stands as well, can't you? Yeah, get front as well. I've um, got one for each. Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously that won't help you if you're doing anything complicated like changing shocks or whatever. Like bearings, but, yeah. for the, but for the run of the mill stuff, which is checking and adjusting your chain tension and that kind of thing, um, stand, paddock stand, ideal. Have that, Cheers, on that one, Stu. Um, Sam Holt, Sam Holt, we're going to have a funny one now. How did you and Penny meet? That is my question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, She's not allowed to say how long ago. She used to work in a special needs school. <laughs> <laughs> She's my nurse. Couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> so you can tell We met on a blind date, believe it or not. Yeah, and she'd have to have been blindfolded to go me, would she? <laughs> Has she taken me off yet? No, apparently not. <laughs> she wouldn't still be here, would she? That's why she walks around like that. So, you know, really bizarre. But yeah, it was go. a blind date set up by my mate Paul. It was going out with my friend Susan. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm uh, not allowed to say how long ago it was, 
Um, unless I mention that Penny was six, because then you won't work out how old she is. Because then I'll get a clout. It would just be the waffles I'd get in the head. That was it. He's been following me around ever since. <laughs> like a puppy. I just, I just follow her own one day. Right, next. Right. Paul James says, I'll be very interested with any questions related to brake fluid. Uh, I've never changed it on a bike I've owned over 30 years, but the subject has always been at the back of my mind. The point I'm making is this, does the rule, if it works, don't fix it, apply? I'm hoping if the subject comes up that the mystery of brake fluid will be brought to light, or is it a terrible truth that no one really knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you're yeah. asking these two? I'm not sure you're in the right place. Yeah. <laughs> It was going somewhere else and just dropped in. Oh, you answer that, you? Um, Well, brake fluid. Uh, rule of thumb, it's good for about two years. Um, <clears throat> the amount of miles you do is almost irrelevant. It's two years, it's a time thing. Uh, brake fluid absorbs water, or moisture. Uh, yeah, that as well. That's yeah. the word. Yeah. <laughs> See that? I just read that. Yeah. I've got it written I've on the back of Penny's head. It's <laughs> hydroscopic. Yeah, it, it absorbs moisture, so it deteriorates, uh, deteriorates over a period of about two years. So. Um, Check out Del Boy's Garage, I think there's a video on how to do it. <laughs> Two or three of them, aren't there? Yeah, yeah so. Yeah. Have yeah, a, change it, mate. Have, a, have a look through his back catalogue, it's in I'll there I'll tell you somewhere. what you can also do is, um, if you open the cap on your reservoir, take the two screws out carefully, because they're easy to chew out, take the cap off one of your reservoirs and have a look, mate. If what it looks like inside is liquid marmite, then you really need to change it. If it's the colour of lager, and we all know the colour of that, <laughs> lager, or some nice cider, then it's absolutely fine. And I know exactly what you mean, you go through your years of owning bikes and you buy them and sell them before that comes round. But yeah. the, the reason that is something comes to, to light recently, we're watching some of the vlog guys, the Polar Bear Challenge guys in the States, one of them had a little 125, he went out for a ride and his brake caliper froze in that polar vortex, minus 400 degrees they've been, <clears throat> our poor brothers have been suffering over there. And the reason we're, is because it's hydroscopic and it absorbs water, he's probably got old brake fluid, it's got a lot of water in it, and it, it subsequently froze and went hard. The brakes wouldn't retract, his front wheel locked up, and he went for a little lie down on the side of the road. Yes. Well, not, not much, he wasn't hurt or anything, and it's that sort of thing. So it's wise to change it. Honestly, mate, it's a piece of cake to do, and it's actually quite good fun, because when it's done, you improve the feel of the brakes. And we've got videos on that. And we have a video on that. <laughs> Guillermo, in Alicante, if I remember rightly. Been there, very nice. Yeah, very nice. Uh, what is the best helmet for you? Well, well you're not going to get much discussion here, are you? Because we all three wear we the same brand. Yeah. We all wear Arai's. Um, I think there's a few that... I, I, I discovered Arai when I was working in the bike trade. Before that, I'd always had AGV and suffered the fact that I could almost get my hands up the side of the yeah. helmet. Because um, the Arai shape is quite long, elongated. You know, so if you've got a long and narrow head, as opposed to a round sort of bean head mm. shape, then they work. If you've got a, uh, a rounded head, then bell helmets work quite well. Yeah, well, um, they, they do say, don't they, in, in sort of modern kit that's available, you're either an Arai shape or you're a showy shape. That's it. The two yeah. are quite different. Yeah. Um, but I wear Arai and have done uh, for a long time, although I do own a Shark yeah. crash helmet, which I bought because I didn't have the £400 to replace an Arai. Yeah. Um, that's, oh, the down, that's the downside. That's the you're, other you're, side of it. Our eyes are expensive. Yeah. You're, you're paying well, for a lifetime actually development. Actually, leads me on to one of the other questions from Mark Ulliet. Mr. Tony um, said, all right, Mark, how are you doing, mate? Hear from you all the time. And Cheers, he Mark. said the same thing. What's the difference between a £100 helmet or a £500 Arai? Is it worth paying the extra, or are you paying £400 for the same? Well, I, I said this to you when we discussed yeah. this question. Um, if it's day one, week one, when you've bought the 100 and the 400 helmet, and they both hit the ground, then the protection is both the same. Three years down the line, five years down the line, the £100 helmet, I wouldn't even risk it, you may as well not wear it, whereas the four £500 helmet will still be working. Yeah. With Years ago, I bashed my arrow. Um, I fell over and smacked it on the ground real hard, and I was a bit concerned, went back to what at the time was Hein Gericke, and yeah. gave them the arrow. they sent it off, they had it x-rayed, and they sent it back with a clean bill of health, uh, and it's just a report, you get a written report to say that it was x-rayed on this day and it was absolutely fine in integrity and it was just some minor scratching and cracking on the gel and it was fine and that gave me the peace of mind. And that was all free? That was completely free. free uh, so what you paid for in the, well that was 400 quid wasn't it, that was my original arrow. And once the six year time comes I decided to move on and buy a new, a new helmet. Now I would also say that if you get a 500 pound helmet, if you're going to buy a helmet second hand on eBay everyone says just don't. 
Yeah. But if you're going to buy an Arai, Shui, Shark, AGV, any of the top stuff, especially the Arai, you can take it to a dealer after you've bought it and have it x-rayed to see if it's okay to wear. If it is, you've got a bargain. I bought my Arai Banda for 100 quid, second hand on eBay. Had it x-rayed. Brand new, wasn't it? Brand new almost, but had it, it x-rayed, it's fine. And I've never had a problem. So I'd say it's worth spending the money on a good lid if you plan to keep it for a long time. And, and a cheap Pro Probably a lid more than any other piece of kit. Yeah. yeah. I I'd certainly say that your hundred pound helmet's fine, but don't expect the same lifespan out of it. No, I mean there, there's a there's a lifetime of development and research, and it's got to be paid for. And of course, it, it ultimately yeah. is reflected in the the price. But that's what you're getting. Well, my, my brother, I can I can stand on this as well. My brother, who lives in Australia, he lives in Brisbane. He's a paramedic, and he said to me that um, irrespective of all the other injuries a biker's going to get, even in an Arai, even in a Shui, a Shark, an ATV, which is the chosen race helmet, mm -hmm. usually you can get an impact that will put you for the rest of your life in front of the staring window and just make you a cabbage. So honestly, mate, it's even a question. Is it even a question? Ask yourself. Save up the money, go and get a bank loan. It's honestly not worth taking a chance. A hundred pound helmet's fine, just wear it for six months, a year. Yeah. Buy another one. That's, that's what it's about, longevity. But, yeah, that's it. But then over the course of five years, you've paid the same, haven't you? So, yeah, probably so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that leads me on to 08 Rides question. Sharp ratings on helmets, are they relevant? Is a Nitro Aikido safer than a Scorpion? I'm going to leave this one to you. Well, I'm, I, am, I am a natural cynic, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know where that comes from, but I am a natural cynic. Um, the Sharp rating was brought about to try and give some consistency to a uh, well, rating system for the kind of stuff that's on the market. Um, at the bottom end of the market, the people that are making cheaper lids because they've now got a benchmark to work towards, they will build or make and manufacture crash helmets to fit the test. Down. Which means if the test involves, for instance, a specific puncture point, that point might be stronger in the cheap crash helmet, but not everywhere else. So much as it is a good thing to have some kind of uniformity yeah. so you can you know, compare one against the other, <coughs> the cheap lids will be built to pass that test and not necessarily to offer the best protection for your head. Yeah. Uh, it's also worth bearing in mind, we were discussing yeah, this the other yeah. day, yeah. Um, I think it's AGV, I mean they have a long standing history with motorsport, they provide some of the top riders with their kit, really 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 good kit, and you've only got to watch MotoGP on a weekend to see the kind right. of things that these riders put kit through, and they stand up and they walk away. Um, yeah, AGV don't always come out very well in the sharp test, so what does that tell you? Work it out. You know, Trust the lid, don't trust the test. Yeah. And how it fits as well, isn't it? I mean, that, oh, that actually, I've, that's, I've a, re a, that's a really because... valid point, actually. That, and that is the most important point of all. Yeah. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't matter how much it costs, no. how good it is, how many tests it's passed, how many gold yeah. stickers it's got on the back. Yeah. If it doesn't fit properly, it's not worth it's got it. Comfortable. It's not worth it. Because AGVs always press on me here, and then you get other ones that press there. So. Yeah, fish cheeks. <laughs> and that's not a good look. You know, they're good. Next uh, one last question, leading on to that, and then I think we need a tea break. You need a tea break. Because oh. um, oh, it's, it's half an hour. I'm we're, halfway, we're halfway through. I'm we're going to really? try and get all this into an hour, so we're halfway through. So we're going to do one more, we'll have a tea break. Leads on a little bit on, on the same topic. Uh, Rock Bay, Scott and Debbie. Scott and America. Debbie. Well, wait, Scott, Scott, you're a gent. You're a gent. Go on. Um, are expensive items worth the extra money? For example, helmets, riding gear, tyres, motor oil, filters. Is it worth spending the extra or not? I'd say it's a balance of what you can afford against how it makes you feel. Yeah. If you've got, when it comes to bike gear, protective motorcycle clothing, um, much as tests are not always the best thing, but if you've got motorcycle clothing that reaches a standard and it's cool and you like it and you want to wear it, then that's, that's brilliant. And when most of us bikers, we've all got one budget, a budget that includes running the house, feeding the babies and looking after everything else. So it's how much you can afford. I think, mm. to be honest, I'm on, I'd love to go and buy a Simpson RX-8 yeah. crash helmet to, yeah. to ride on the street fighter, but I can't afford 500 quid. or justify it. I mean, that's the point, isn't it? It's not about whether you can afford something. You've got to look at what other expenses you've got. You might need a new pair of tyres. Or, sure or, or justify or whatever, it. So. Isn't it. I mean, I, recently I found on the net uh, a, a wonderful backlight for the Triumph, and I've been doing the project to smart it up. It's a little dinky cast alloy lucas it looks gorgeous it looks like a light that'd be on the back of an old ajs lovely 150 pounds by the time we shipped it from the states and at this time we just can't justify that we'd love to own it but i think what you're talking about is good kit against bad kit aren't you and spending the extra money i mean well, well we've already covered crash helmets so, um, yeah i yeah. mean 
I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of decent boots. Yeah. Um, but then conversely, I buy some, I buy and use some pretty rubbish jackets. Well, I don't know, we, we, were, because, in, we uh, were in the surplus store. Go yeah. On. No, go on. We were in the surplus store, weren't we? We wandered around Frontline surplus store just recently, and I, I found a British Army Gore-Tex DPM combat coloured oversuit. Yeah. 39 quid. Yeah. Now I'm going to buy that on the next need one because it's it's just an oversuit. But safety gear, so this, this I think it's a split answer. Also, it depends as well. It's safety like clothing, it is very much, especially for women, it's very difficult because a lot of uh, Risha do wonderful um, shaped clothing. They do. So the yeah. rocker will, will rocker will make you the kit That's the point. for your size, yeah. your yeah. Length, length versus your width. Yeah. If so, you're a disproportionate size, then spending the extra money to get something that fits properly yeah. as you come out to your bike with lids. Yeah. Jackets as well. If you, my brother will tell me as a paramedic, someone will go sliding down the road at 60 miles an hour. If their clothing is correctly fitting, then the uh, pads that protect the extremities will stay in place. If you've got baggy ass pants on, it's no use having no. knee armour because by the time you land, the knee armour is going to end up around the back of your and thigh. Not only that, they fall out on the way from Brighton. <laughs> Yes. Have you, did you ever find them? No. No. I'm probably in that bloke's windscreen with the fucking bar weight. And on that note, I think we need a cup of tea because it's freezing in here. Right, we're going to just break for 30 seconds, come back for the rest. We're about, and we're halfway, halfway through. Halfway through. Halfway through. Right, see you for the next in a minute. Cut. Oh, brilliant. <sighs> well, I've made myself at <laughs> Right. Tea break. It's a Battenberg cake. Well, what's the next question, Pen? Huh? Can you dunk Battenberg? Can you? Yeah. <laughs> can you dunk Battenberg? I don't, know. I don't know. Let's have a look. Can you dunk Battenberg? Yeah, I reckon you can. Yeah, it works. Oh, I've only dropped half of mine. It's not messy though, is it? <laughs> mm. Right. Right. Next question. One, two, like three. I M V says, "Do you have a favourite or dream bike, or do you already own, or have you owned it?" Do you mm. want to start? Mm. I reckon. Um, Dad's got cake to eat. Well, got Dad's cake. Got, he's got cake to eat. I'll take care of business first. Well, I think twofold question really, or twofold answer. For me, um, I'm going to give that in two because there's two that two iconic bikes in my life that I've never owned. One I probably never will, um, and the other always stands as being the best of all for me. And that was the fantastic Kawasaki Z 1300. It came out in a time when the Triumph Bonneville and you are there, dear? Yeah. And the Norton you Commando. Leak it a bit there, <laughs> you leak it a bit. <laughs> yeah, Z1300. It came out in a time when motorcycles, the biggest bikes on the road, were Triumph Bonnevilles and perhaps a Harley Electric Glide. And this thing was absolutely colossal. It had a tank like a coal bunker, yeah. it? an engine like a block of council masonettes, and it was just ridiculous. It sounded like a Merlin Aero engine. And I just thought that was amazing. It was the most ridiculous muscle bike of all. And I love them to this day. Um, they're still around, you can still find them, can't you? Yeah. Uh, modified in all sorts of ways. But my absolute favourite, one that stands alone above all other bikes, is Evil Knievel's XR750. Oh, cool. Not just any XR750, Evil Knievel's one. Because it had a 1,000cc heads on, because he put the XR1000 top end on to give it more grunt for getting up over the buses. And I just think that's cool. <laughs> So XR750 in white with the blue stars and stripes, that's mine. What about you, Dave? I, like you, have two. Um, completely different as it goes. Cool. For me, it would have to be a post-1949 Vincent Black Shadow. Oh. It has to be a post-1949 one, because that was based on the Series C repeat, rather than the Series B. I won't bore you with all that. But, Good. But, <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise I'll get a waffle in the face. You'll get a waffle. And, and, and I've had some Battenberg, yeah. so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but no, really, 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 really fantastic bike. I mean, it was uh, a world leader in its day, and and it still held the record for the fastest production motorcycle twenty years after it went out of production. So you know, it's an awesome machine. And the second one is a well. Is that anyway? Is your first bike? Is that the one that was on the salt flats and the bloke in his underpants yes. laying on it? Yes, is that laying it? on. That's it. That's cool for that alone, but, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that's it. Yeah. All you, the gear all the time. You can ride it in your shreddies. <laughs> So, <laughs> straight line up. Sorry. How so cool is that? <laughs> Next, what's your other one? And the second one, simply because of what it represents and where it sits in uh, more sporting history than anything else, is Baron Sheen's RG500. Oh! oh. Yeah, cool. 
Any any two stroke 500, really. Yeah, because yeah. two stroke just... 500. Why not? What's why not why, why wouldn't you want one? Kevin Swans, RG 500. Why wouldn't you want one? What's not to like? Ridiculous bike, way too much power. Absolutely. In a power yeah. band as wide as a bee's dick. Everything about it is ridiculous. <laughs> and that's why I like it. That's it. What about you, Pam? What's your favourite bike? Uh, uh, as you all know, I love my sportsters. Absolutely love my sportsters. So uh, I've had two gorgeous sportsters I'm really happy with. But I do love the Rough Cross uh, Iron Gorilla. Cool. Very cool. It's all wheels, isn't it? It's all wheels. And it's all wheels. I'd love a zero chopper. Oh, no, you're talking. Those are all Japanese rough ass choppers. If yeah, you want to send me one, I can show it for you. <laughs> if you're watching this, Amamato, could you send me a zero chopper, yeah. please? Road test will be yours. Road test? Yeah, we'll do a video on it, don't worry. We'll pick we'll you up. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, right, John Mirror. John. Hi, John. Hello, John. Not sure if you've covered this in your other videos, but here's a question. When preparing for winter riding, what variables are important in terms of gear and riding technique? Actually, quite relevant actually because it's got really cold today. Yeah, it is really cold today. Yeah. Well, uh, more relevant than ever. Poor our poor cousins in America have been experiencing a, uh, the most ridiculous temperatures. Um, so there's a lot to be said for that. Don't if you're going to ride. But I would say there's. I want to doff a cap here to our friend NTA. Yes. Because um, the whole polar bear challenge thing is fantastic. We did it last year when it was yeah. cold enough. It's too warm. This it's year. too warm here. But um, I think riding in the cold is is a whole hobby in itself. I think preparing for it, buying the right gear for it, um, preparing yourself, little things like having room inside your clothing for warm air to build up uh, so that you can keep that, that pops really to the wetsuit thing, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, the way a wetsuit keeps you warm is it gets a layer of water inside it that your body then preheats uh, and so on and so on. It's the same with riding in, in, in the cold. Um, it's just hours of that, it's kind of a long question. Yeah, yeah. I mean fundamentally it's twofold, isn't it? I mean it's about you and it's about the bike, um, yeah. I mean as, as, as obvious as it seems. And being, it depends how far you go as well, doesn't it? Yes. You might yeah. only be doing four miles, you could be doing yeah. 40 miles. Yeah. 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 Being warm and comfortable is, is key, obviously. Yeah. But I mean, that's just so obvious, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, and just keeping your bike just, just so. Mm. Um, here in the UK, we get lots of salt on the roads when the yeah. weather's icy. Yeah, it's more than about the cold, isn't it? Keeping that out of your brakes and, and the like, just, you know, regularly, just, just rinsing them off at the end of a, end yeah. of a run. Um, yeah. Making sure that your, your wheels, there's a little thing that was covered just a little while ago by Roadcraft Nottingham, he made a mention that having the front brake or the front wheel free running, if your front brake's binding yeah. due to any form of corrosion in your pads or discs or uh, calipers, uh, that's going to cause your front resistance. The resistance on that tyre is like riding along with a little bit of brake on. And in a slight icy, slimy road, to, you would not ride along with a bit of front brake on because the minute you lean the bike, it's going to low side. So he made a very good point there. Um, that's a very big safety point. Yeah. You know, keeping your bike maintained almost like an athlete. Treat your bike like an athlete. Its maintenance must be absolutely tip top. More in the winter, way more, would yeah. you say, in yeah. the winter than ever in the summer. To be honest, in the summer, you can almost, by comparison, neglect them. And it's the same for yourself, you know, warm yourself up first. Yeah. You, my grandfather taught me this because he, he's, he's uh, career in the Royal Navy. He, he did some time in the Arctic convoys and stuff and said that the, the ice, you know, if you're warm when you start, he used to go out and do an eight hour watch on deck in the ice, and if you're warm when you go up on deck, you come down reasonably warm. Yeah. If you're cold when you go up, you've got half an hour to live. It's in, in the polar regions, and of course, again, our mates in America have suffered this. So be warm, be really toasty, including your hands, before you go out to the environment. Particularly your hands, I would say. Particularly. In fact, to that end, when I'm going anywhere in the cold, I have a tendency to have a spare pair of gloves in my jacket. Yeah, warm. Um, pre warmed. Yeah, yeah 100, miles down, 100 miles down the road. Gloves, sort of gloves off. Sort them over. Gloves on. Sort this, is, this is what my grandfather would say to me that if you're cold, you're not effective. No. That was a little phrase he said. And because you need the dexterity in your fingers to, to operate your levers, and that might be in an emergency situation. Yeah. So if your fingers are frozen solid, again, there's, a, there's, there's so much of this. You can yeah. rattle onto the waffle at you in the face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which it's going to do in a minute. And if it's frozen, it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> frozen off. That's why we only gave Penny a sponge one. <laughs> uh, Rob O says, I've got a Honda XR125 and I'm wondering if I could fit a kickstart to it as the engine is the same as a Honda CG5, so I've been told. So in theory I should be able to change the kickstart gear to my bike off a Honda CG125. Is that right? Don't know. I haven't tried it. Uh, yeah. Well, this You've got an answer to this, but well, my, my quick answer is if there's more to just taking it off one and putting on another because yeah. there'll be there's a shaft in the gearbox that's going to have to come out enough 
out of the side in order to put the kickstart on it, that to give you that peg, that spigot. And that means you're going to strip and rebuild the gearbox. So if it's whether you're up to it, and that's your yeah. Point. Well, that was yeah, precisely my point. Um, I, I don't know exactly because I, I'm not overly familiar with the, with the two versions of that engine. I know they are broadly similar, uh, and they probably are similar enough. But um, it is quite a work up to do. Uh, there's a lot of bits to change, and uh, I don't wish to sound condescending, but if, if you're if you're asking the question, um, then I have to ask: Do you feel you're really up to it? Um, yeah. Do you, you need it? It? Do you really need a kickstart? Um, you know, I, I know we all grew up with kickstarts, but but yeah. you know you've got the, you've got the button there, and if push comes to shove, it's yeah. a one two five. You can bump it very easily. Yeah. Um, Most well, people progress to a bigger bike anyway. Yeah, yeah. no bikes have them anymore. Well, the other side of it is, I mean, pay more attention to your battery, keep your battery charged up, and you won't go flat and need one. Um, you know, it's like, but well, I think that's the point to make, isn't it? It's possible because all things are possible. All things are possible. You can put a V8 in your bike if you like. Yes. It's whether you can do it. So it's to ask yourself: Are you competent at doing that job? And if you've got a second-hand old beater with the kickstart, why not pull it apart and see what you think? It's up to you, my friend. You learn as you go. Okay. Next question: Van Rocco, 66. Jeff, what up, brother? Uh, I'm considering buying a Triumph. Can you oh. tell me the pros and cons to owning one? I'm well, a bit you, wary. You'll be cool straight away. You'll be cool. <laughs> so what's more? The end of our next question. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Go on. What do you reckon, Pen? Well, it, it's it, it's too probably too long an answer for for this question and answers really. And by choice, um, a personal thing, isn't it? It, it is. is. It depends on your style, what you want to use it for. So it's. Uh, well, Jeff's very much like us because we've known we've known Jeff for a long time. Um, he's very much like us. It's a recreation thing for for you, I believe, Jeff and. I think that's that's what it's about. What I like the most is when you look at the internet and you see the videos that exist for Triumph. They're the same as the ones in style that exist for Harley, aren't they? Yeah. Very much. Yeah. Uh, Triumph and Harley Davidson um, have have grown that credibility in the kudos of their brand to be worth owning just for the sake of owning. And I think the best indemnification, is that the word, the best oh, sort I think of, you might have just made that up. I did make that up. Do you think it's good? Like that. He usually just puts an AGE on the end. AGE, yeah. yeah. The, best, the best bear outage that this is the case. That's better. Bear outage. The, the bear outage of this is when you look at the Japanese. Now we've all known that the Japanese haven't really invented anything since the third century and the samurai sword, no. but they copy everything else everyone else makes and then prove it. But when you look at it, they're not really doing that. When you look at the Brat style thing, the Brat style thing originally came from Japan. You look at Zero Choppers, they're all working with Harley Davidsons. And you look at what the Japanese and the, the people in the Far East are doing with Triumphs. You know, they've taken these brands as iconic, timeless, Western brands. And I think, certainly for me, the Triumph is a brand thing because it goes back to my dad's days. My dad had a Triumph. I've got a picture of a T100 on, on a dockside because he was in the Navy. Um, in black and white taken in the early 1960s and it's the same as that Triumph sitting there next to the camera and I like that, That's that says something to me so it's, it's a personal thing isn't it? What do you reckon Pen? It's a Harley for you isn't it? Oh, I love Harleys, I know some people don't but that's just what I, I just love them it's a, it's a long question and I, uh, you know it, It's a it, personal it, choice isn't it? It really, you, you yeah. can't you, you can certainly There's no easy can, answer to no, There's no you, pros and cons really You can extol the virtues of any given bike but you can't recommend can well, There's no pros and cons because they're, they're, they're a yeah. front low manufacturer, they won't let you yeah. down It's not like buying a Chinese bike <laughs> Thanks <laughs> Next question Do you, Can you dip waffles in your tea? <laughs> what, before you take them out of the packet? Yeah, it probably lasts ages then <laughs> Thank Could you Could have been a frozen one yeah, so It's right. between your teeth though yeah. <laughs> Right, Shut next question off. Cameron's Folly says by magic you've won a hundred million on the lotto. Oh thanks, bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do? Buy a new razor. And if you could visit any YouTubers in the world, who would you visit? No, oh, all of them. <laughs> Just Everyone. a world tour. A world tour. There's no question, is there? I'd buy one of the massive chrome polished Airstream. Well that's what we were expecting today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the makeup girl never showed up. Yeah, bloody oh, makeup girl never up. I never got the puppies in my trailer that I asked for. And the blue smarties. All the blue, blue smarties. smarties. And the Evion water turned out to be from Iceland. <laughs> in the form of a lump. Right, uh, uh, yeah, just visit everyone. Uh, just make a world tour, world visit tour. every YouTuber and make a video of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Definitely. Next question. Better keep on me ticket. Uh, Brett Snow, hi Brett in Australia. What oil is the best to run on my bike? He's got a Bandit, if you remember. Bandit 400, yep. Yeah. What is the optimum gearing for my bike? For motorway riding, town riding, two up riding, touring, etc. 
Right. So there's two questions there. Well, the, the oil's already been covered, really, yeah. isn't it? I mean, we've, we've, we've yeah. talked about, I mean, yeah, Bandit runs 1040. The, the point I'd say about your 400 Bandit, mate, is that it revs probably a bit higher than the 12s. Yeah. Yes. So you probably want something with a higher shear strength. I'd probably go for a semi-synthetic 1040. Although you live in, a, in, in the south of the Australian continent down there in Victoria, so I would say that look to your weather. If it's really hot, um, probably a 1050, 2050. 2050 Go for a 2050 high res, you know, something like um, Castrol 2T, a Motul. 40. 40 even. 40. 2T would be fun, wouldn't 40, it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it smells nice, though. It smells nice, yeah. like chicken oil. <laughs> um, and the other question was gear, wasn't it? Yeah. Gear. Well, they're three to one, aren't they? Pretty much, pretty 90 much. 90% of the bikes are three to one, which means three teeth on the back sprocket to one on the front. So you get 45 rear, 15 front. Um, and leave it as it is from the manufacturer, unless you need an alternative Yeah, I mean, the, manufa facility. the manufacturer has gauged that bike to do a range of different things, and that's, that's the right. gearing that they reckon is best for it. Um, yeah. If you only go up the motorway, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 miles every day, and come back the same route, and that's all you ever do, then yeah, there might be some there might be some, you know, some worth in changing the gearing. And conversely, if all you do is to around town, or you maybe. like doing stunts and you like doing your yeah, wheelie, and yeah, then you want to yeah. load more torque on pull away, you can put a bigger, a bigger, uh, bigger on the front. As it were, bigger on the front gives you uh, one tooth on the front gives you three off the back, so that would give you a higher gear. So that'd be like running an overdrive. And if you put a smaller front sprocket on, that's the same as putting a three teeth bigger sprocket on the back. Yeah. So that's going to drop maybe 10, 15 miles an hour if you top speed. But it will give you greater acceleration. Yeah, you'll get a lot more grunt uh, off the line if that's what you need. So if you bike, if you look at 400 struggling off the line and you find you never ride it over 75, you might, just an experiment, because the great thing with doing the front is you can adjust it out of the chain. Don't you? Yes. So if you, I mean, if it was your 400, all I would do, because I know you've got, I've seen your shed, I've seen your amazing facility, I would try putting a smaller sprocket on the front, one tooth less, and see how you get on. You might find the bike works less hard to pull away, yeah. um, less hard accelerating, you might get more overtaking power, which is good, or more overtaking torque, and you're not gonna miss what you lose off the top, it would just be a little bit quicker off pull away, wouldn't it? What age bandit is it? That's a 90s something, isn't it? No, yeah, I'm not sure, it doesn't say I think it's a 90s band, it's band. same as, I think it's so like a late. So the speedo's off the front wheel? Uh, there's the other issue, isn't it? If your speedo cable is, is running from the front wheel, uh, there's not no issues issue. there. Um, yeah. The, late, the, the legs are bad, it's... Mark 2's, it's Mark, a 400, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, if no, I don't if know your speedo point. runs off your front sprocket, you'll, you might find your speedo goes out yeah. of accuracy if that bothers you. Uh, but it's, uh, I mean, the, the calculation What's is... What's the speedo for? Uh, uh, <laughs> that's where you put your gloves when you take your Put your gloves when you take your end off, yeah. But yeah, your speedo will be out by, what, about 6%, wouldn't it, if you change one tooth? Um, which leads on to Josh Arthur. Hi Josh. Josh, hello mate. Uh, hello, my question is, when trying to get more top end or more acceleration out of a bike, which cogs do you change? Right. And what are the downsides to doing this? Well, that's the There's same two question. questions. The same more question top end, more acceleration. Very worded there, isn't it? Yeah, so it's, if you want more acceleration, you put, imagine, this is the easiest way, imagine your bicycle, your derailleur block on the back has those varied sized cogs. The biggest cog on the back is the lowest gear, that's first, and the smallest cog, that's your highest gear, that's top gear. So if you imagine you want a bigger sprocket on the back of your bike, it's gonna give you more pull away. You can achieve that by a smaller sprocket on the front. So it's not difficult to work out. One tooth missing off the front is like three teeth added to the rear, so you get much more acceleration and you'll lose a bit of top end. If you want more top end, add a sprocket tooth to the front, put a 16 on. You can buy them from Goodridge and people like that, or Earls, they make those sprockets. And once you've done that, you just adjust out the slack in the chain. Um, I think it pretty covers it. Yeah. Pretty much. Any downsides? Uh, well, I mean, one is always a trade-off for the other, isn't it? If you, greater acceleration is a lower top speed, greater top speed is... Yeah. So you've got to yeah. you've so got, yeah. yeah, you're not making more performance, you're just adjusting you're, where... You're just moving where it is. You're moving yeah. where it is, yeah, like miles under the lawn. The other side is, the only disadvantage might be that if you've got a, a sprocket-driven speedo drive, that your speedo's going to go out in, of accuracy, if that bothers you. Okay. Uh, this question's from S161064. Yeah, cool username. Uh, yeah. I know I have a very rare 19, uh, 1988 GSF XF400. Which I want to get a four into one exhaust for. Right. Will the GSXF 600 exhaust fit the bike? No. Yeah, the bikes look the same. Only uh, the 600 is water cooled and not oil cooled. No, not at all. No. Sadly, not. Is the short answer. No. No. The 
The fundamental difference will be the, the hole in the cylinder head, known as the port, the exhaust port on the 600 will be bigger than the exhaust port on the 400. Um, the, the height of the cylinder head from the bottom of the engine block will be different, so where the pipes on your 600 curve, you put them on your 400, you can have a massive gap, they're going to be too long, it just won't fit, simple as that. Um, if you've got a friendly breaker who's got a set of second hand 600 pipes and will allow you free to take them home and offer them up, the buy me offer them up, but I'd say a million to one. It, it's, yeah, it's unlikely that you'll get anywhere no. close, to be honest. No. Um, I mean, the only other way to make a four into one for looks, if you've got four into two with a collector, what some people can do is take off the left hand pipe, block up the hole, and you can do that in a number of ways. That's just your ingenuity, you can put a cap over it, all sorts of things, but block up the one, then you've got a four into one, and then just reject it so it runs correctly. Uh, but the little 400s, they're quite touchy, aren't they? I've never seen one in the flesh. Never really? Seen one in the now, flesh. When, I, when I ran a bike shop, we used to import a lot of the Japanese 400s, the grey import stuff f direct from Japan, which was created for their market, for their licensing laws. And some of them were smaller bikes, they were physically miniature bikes. Uh, I think you had a baby fire blade, didn't you, at one point? A little CBR 400 mm. gull arm. Absolutely lovely little bike. Very nice, yeah. Yeah, little gull arm, absolutely tiny. Only one of all those bikes was ever imported or manufactured for the UK, and that was the RVF 400, yeah. wasn't it? Um, the, the big one, and they were six grand for a 400. So they didn't sell because people who ride 400s are usually younger riders, and six grand's too much for them. Um, I'd say it ain't gonna work, mate. Some of those 400s were the same size, weren't they? Uh, Kawasaki uh, yeah. ZZR 600, yeah, yeah. ZZR 400, they were identical bikes. Pull the fairing off, totally different engine inside. Um, so I would say, don't know for sure, do we? Don't know for sure, but I would very much doubt it. Very much doubt it, mate. It's not likely, it's not logical, is it? Okay. Uh, Nicola Robinson, hi Nick. Nick, hey, you all right, hon? Uh, you need to check out the channel. It's yeah, very right, cool. Yeah. Very it's cool. cool. What has been your most favourite bike? Oh, I like these. Well, questions. there's three parts to this question. So, your favourite bike uh, that I presume that you've owned? Favourite bike. Well, I covered it earlier, didn't we? When we said the XR 750 stroke thousand that Evil Knievel used to ride. Um, mainly because I think for me, it's when I went to Wembley in the 70s. Yeah, but I think she's asking um, your favourite bike of what you've owned. Of what I've owned. And the way, is it because it says most favourite bike, mm. the biggest lemon or jinx bike <laughs> that you've bought? Oh, well, how many do you want? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know, have a few of them. Have a small selection of them. Oh, that's easy. The, the best bike. And the one for me, that you've regretted selling? Same. For me, the best bike that I've had, that I've owned, and regretted selling all in one, is the green fat boy bobber that's in the banner. If you look at our channel, look at the channel banner, there's a, there's a peppermint green um, fat boy bobber, um, big, uh, um, it's not 30, was it? It was a quid twin cam. Um, I bought that from Dog820. It was half built because the previous owner had been tragically killed, one of the salesmen there. I bought it from the company, finished building it, and we had it featured on the cover of 100% Biking, didn't we? Um, I've got the issue somewhere, I can show you that at some point. And we, we sold it because of the rigours of the recession. We needed the money and I traded down to a sportster, so that was it. That's for me. What you, mate? Well, best bike is it's a funny one, my best one. Um, unusually, it, it's a Suzuki GS400, 1978 GS400. Oh, they're twin. Yeah, 400 twin. Yeah, yeah. Around. And it, I think it is my favourite bike, not because it is the best bike or whatever. But it's where it fits in my biking history. Um, you know, I was, I was, well, I just passed my test. I was 17 years old. Right of passage. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a right of passage, and that's where it sits in my history. So, for me, that features very strongly. Um, yeah. it's, it's, so it's less to do with the bike, more about me. Yes, really. you love yeah. about you, Ben. Uh, I did love my green and white um, Sportster, but I, I, I don't ever regret selling anything because I, I, I love my black one now. Okay. So. What about the LC? No, no, I think I, I don't think you do. I, I never look back. You got to, you know, you make a Before decision it. and then yeah. you get another one. Very wise, so. very wise. I think it's just us blokes yeah. with a starry eyed old kids. Well, I'd, I'd keep them all if I could. Oh yeah, I'd have Jay Leno's garage. Mind yeah. you, never looks on the right. Yeah. Uh, uh, what has been no. your biggest lemon or yeah, jinx yeah, bike? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh dear. I think the hardest bike I ever rode was a Bentley. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's for all of us. Um, that Honda Bentley, I remember that. Paid 11 quid for that. I had a GS750 with knackered shocks yeah. that I wrote off on the A3. In <laughs> well, the shocks on the bike. The whole bike. Oh, yeah. really? T turns out, 85 mile an hour front puncture, dumb mix. Oh, no, just bought it whole morning, man. Uh, I mean, the, the bike was jinxed from day one. Yeah. I had nothing but trouble with it. Right. Um, 
Yeah. Biggest yeah. lemon, what can I say? Oh, it's got to be that CZ250, isn't it? <laughs> Do you remember that? A CZ250 Is that the one with the key lever pulled out? For yeah, your key lever pulled yeah, out yeah, becomes a yeah. kickstart. Oh, it's quite clever, that. <laughs> and I, I, I painted it um, combat green and black, did a DPM wrap job on it, didn't we? And I sold it to a mate at work for about tenner. I it blew up the next day. <laughs> I had to give his money back. He wanted change. He wanted change. All he wanted was some interest. <laughs> Compensation. <laughs> Piece of shit. Yeah, so East European bike was mine. CZ. <laughs> and, next. and what's the daftest thing you or uh, that you've done to a bike? Daftest thing I've done to a bike? Paint it with Humbrol paints. <laughs> Come back green and black and sell it to a mate. Airfix me out. I went to yeah. a model shop. I went to Westbourne Model Shop and I bought their entire stock of those little aerosol yeah. pens you get for Airfix models. Yeah. About 30 tins. Well, I've still got a little tin of gloss black. Yeah. I use it for touching up frames. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I paint the whole bike with it though. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting the brush in the tin. Though, it is, it? yeah. Especially one of three inch brushes. I don't know, really. I think that's the darkest thing. I think, oh, yeah, I there's loads of stuff and they can go on yeah, forever. Yeah, I'll get yeah. a waffle thrown at me yeah. if I do that much. Well, mine was converting my other Harley to a 1200, which was great, sounded awesome and talky, but I lived in the fuel station. It was. <laughs> 60 to a tank full. Nightmare. Uh, B2A FUED says, Hi, Del. Uh, I have a question. Other than moving air, what's good for eliminating or reducing fog on your windshield and or your face shield? Thanks, Doug. Right, should have brought it in. Should have brought it in. Should have brought it in. Um, well, I use um, visor. I use a pin lock insert on mine. Um, arrow, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, they come, they're part of arrow, aren't they? If you've got an arrow, yeah. it's the pin lock, yeah. which is a, like a double glazed. Yeah. Uh, I think NT8 referred to it as a dual pane, which, which is a second which sheet. Is, yeah. yeah. It's a second sheet of plastic inside the plastic visor, so it's double glazed. It's got a rubber seal around it, and it's an arrow eye thing. You get an arrow eye visor, they have two little plastic studs. Yeah, two little they? pins. Um, and then, yeah. You just put them on. I mean, there's other things you can. There's fluids. And there are yeah. various fluids. Right. People like Bob Heath make yeah. make a, a sort of a wipe on product. Uh, Rainex. Rainex. Good old Rainex. Uh, you spread that on the inside. Yeah. yeah. Somebody said the other day, spit on it like a diver. I don't think they clearly tried that because <laughs> I tried and it wasn't very nice. Yeah. <laughs> I had to stop and take it off and clean it. It's that green lumpy bit. It's about yeah. It's the lumpy bit, isn't it? <laughs> When you wipe it around, it scratches. It does, yeah. That's not nice. That's a bad mood. I mean, I mean, there is there is the old sort of um, the old faithful uh, washing up liquid trick, isn't there? Which yeah. uh, a lot of people say doesn't work, but I it makes I, a mottled look though. Cause I, it I think the problem distorts. is a lot of people don't do it how it was originally intended. But no. um, but yeah, there, there's a variety of products on the market. There is. wipe on. And yeah. so on, but I personally like Pinlock. Yeah, Pinlock's the best. It never fails. You can even sneeze with the visor down yeah. on a rainy day. Yeah. It just doesn't. It's brilliant. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, next question is RC22. What signs do you look for when your valve stem oil seals start to fail? <laughs> right. The ability to see next door. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Clouds of smoke, mm -hmm. doesn't it? The identify. Um, the ability to identify blue. <laughs> the colour blue. Right. A serious answer. Yeah. Serious if you if you look at the way that your valves work, they poke, they they join. If you look at the hole that they sit in, it goes down into the actual uh, combustion chamber and up into the um, tap it chamber or rocker chamber where the valves are, uh, or where the, the cams are. Now there's oil up the top there, obviously there's oil in your cam cover and that oil will run down the side of the valves and into the chamber and it will burn and you'll get smoke out the back. And it is a specific colour that smoke. It's blue it? It, it, it yeah. is blue. Very very much blue. So if there's still, there's a rubber seal basically round the valve stem and that stops Sorry. Uh, can we, we ain't got to move on already? Have we? <laughs> that that rubber seal stops the oil running down the side. So when that valve stem seal starts to fail, you will then get oil running down the side of the valve into the combustion chamber, and it will burn. And as it burns, as Dave said, it is distinctly blue, a bluey purple colour like nothing else. Not like white or black smoke, blue smoke. And obviously the other side of it as well, you might get a bit more. You'll get a big puff on start yeah. because obviously if, if it drains down overnight, you'll get a collection. It is quite dangerous, isn't it? Well, actually, that, that's worth noting because the early symptoms are very similar to the to the symptoms for when your rings start to go. Yeah. Because in the same way, there's oil in the sump, and that is allowed to pass up into the combustion same. changer. Yeah. Ch changer. 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 <coughs> but that's that, that's yeah. <laughs> but that that great waft of smoke on starter is what differentiates valve stems from piston yeah. rings because you don't get that with piston rings. No you don't. No that's right, it's got to be sucked up from the bottom. Yeah. The other side of it is to do a, do a leak down test. If you've got the equipment or you can lay your hands on it, a leak down test is brilliant because you pump pressure into the cylinder. If you hear a hissing out of the um, crank 
crankcase breather, then the pressure's going down the side of the bores into the crankcase. If you hear a hissing out of the rocker, co rocker cover breather, you know it's going up the side of the valves, and it will tell you where it's leaking. Um, and that's another test. But basically, you know that they're going to start to leak, or when they're leaking, by blue smoke puffing out of the exhaust. Right. Next one. Uh, next question is from Mark Walker, who's in, uh, who lives in Singapore and Bangkok, uh, where it's beep beep hot all the time. <laughs> cool would that be? <laughs> to live in Singapore. He, cool. he says he's got three CBR fire blades, 900 to 1,000. That's even more cool. That's just great. Mm. I live in Bangkok and I have three fire blades. I like, I like him already, don't you? I like you already, mate. He's got a 98, a 2004 and a 2005 version. Oh, that's 1,000. Um, they're all suffering from charging system problems. He's been paying out money. Um, to have these uh, coils and rectifiers uh, changed, uh, but apparently uh, CBRs are renowned for this issue. But the warranty replacement was only in the USA. It was. Um, yeah. Well, no, me, it's it's replaced well, no, it's the uh, Honda rectifier with a Hayabusa one, um, which has worked well for a while. But have you got any uh, suggestions? Long question. Oh, you know about these, don't you? Right. Well, I, I yeah, I've a bit of history with '90s um, fire blades. Um, they are, as you say, they are prone to this problem. Um, the problem is based around heat, really. The, the regulator rectifier unit, um, <clears throat> well, you've obviously thought diagnosis in the past, as you say, you've changed a couple, so I won't waffle on too much about that. <clears throat> but they do fail through heat. Uh, the, the alternators on fire blades pump out quite a lot of grunt, and they make the regulators work quite hard. The original fitment on the 90s ones had no fins. I don't know about the later ones. Smooth box, they were a smooth box. <laughs> um, the aftermarket it's ones that are right. available are all fin. Uh, I don't know about the high boost one. I, I don't know how that fits they are, up. They're mine, wasn't mine. But if you if you yeah. were to go on onto um, eBay and the like and get an aftermarket replacement regulator uh, rectifier unit for a, for a fire blade, it will now be fin, yeah. which will help you with your heat dissipation to some point. But the best, the best help you can get is it fits on, as you're obviously aware, it fits on a plate on the frame. And what you need to do is you need heat conductivity into that plate so you can use your frame as a heat sink. And the easy way of doing that is get some stuff, comes in a tube about the size of toothpaste, it's called heat sink compound. It's a white, chalky, horrible stuff. Yeah. Um, some parts of the world, dielectric grease, I think they call Something it. Something like that, yeah, it's just literally... Yeah. It just makes it wet, and it's so what, what, it, yeah, what it actually does is it's a heat conductive paste, and you just smear that on the back of on the back of your unit. So when you actually fix that to the plate on the frame, you're getting good heat conductivity yeah. through the plate into the Sucking frame, the and the frame becomes part of the heat sink, and it enables you to mm. suck heat away much more efficiently. I mean, you um, can you can even make more modifications. Just noticing yeah. where you live, it's probably hot as you like. Yeah. So if what that is to me, that sounds like it's an opportunity for some mods. I'd be looking into copper. Copper is the best heat sink there is. It will suck heat away from yeah. something that it's not even touching. It's incredible. Yeah. So personally, if you bolted it onto a copper plate, yeah. and then you put that stuff either side, that's going to draw the heat out of it. Because that's what it's about, isn't it? It's the reason that yeah. these fire blade things fail is simply because they, they, can't, they get overheated. And where you live, they're getting even more overheated. The warranty thing won't help you in America because they just put new ones on. We've had all this with warranties, yeah, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. So many companies, so many manufacturers, Triumph do it, Harley do it, and they're, they're all guilty of it. All they do is replace the standard item. They don't upgrade, they don't mod, they don't do with it. And I think we're, we're witnessing that with NT8 at the moment with his head gate, his rocker cover gasket. They're not modifying the bike, they're not, they're not searching the problem, they're just rectifying what's wrong with a simple replacement like for like. And that's not the remedy because it wouldn't have gone four times on his bike no. for the same reason. So in terms, Look to get some copper, copper fasteners. You can buy copper washers, obviously. Maybe make a little grill around it. Yeah. You know, the, the fins. Fins are what you're looking for in there. You're, Anything you're, to dissipate. You're looking for um, surface area. That's yeah. what you want. Also, me, I'd be looking at perhaps mounting a computer fan yeah. in front of it. Fortunately, the fans in the bottom of computers run on 12 volt. They do. Um, they do. But you can pick them up in the tip. Go down your yeah. local tip, smash a computer open, and you'll find the little plastic fans in the back. There's usually two or three of them. In fact, you can buy them in Maplins for a yeah, tenner. for a tenner. So if you manage to find a little way of mounting a fan that blows cold air or blows air directly onto that, then you've got conductivity, then you're going to actually cool that rectifier down and eliminate the problem. You'll certainly make it a lot better, won't you? Yeah. You, don't, you don't say in your question how, how much sort of background you've, you've checked out on this already, but things like this are a common fault with fire blades. Very much so. Which means it will be all over every fire blade forum. If you yeah. like, find some fire blade forums or some Honda forums, yeah. 
You go on Blade, Blade Runner's forum, they, they, yeah. there'll, there'll be some, there'll, well, there'll be several people on there that have probably done it. They'll be able to tell you which particular brand of uh, unit they've used. That's it. Um, where yeah. they've got the kit from and how much it costs. So, Easy. There's a fix for you, mate. Uh, Arturus S says evening. Evening. Morning. Morning. Morning now. Well, it's not, it's morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon now. My question would be lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> Roast dinner, so <laughs> Roast dinner. Right, go uh, My question is: uh, electronic fuel injection or carbs? Which is more reliable and gives the best performance? In a direct answer to your question, fuel injection is more reliable and more efficient. But I don't think that means it's better because when it goes wrong or you want to adjust it, it's computers, it's laptops, it's download programs, it's it's remapping. That's difficult. Whereas if you want to change something on your motorcycle that's got carburetors, you just fiddle around with the jets and you get the jetting right. Um, they're trying to make the motorcycle intelligent, and I think that there's, it's not really working. They're trying to do. It's all about emissions, isn't it? Um, yes. When we took the Triumph up, in fact, you come with me. Didn't yeah. We went out to get the Triumph remapped, which very kindly Triumph did for free for us. They said that the mechanic there said that one of the nicest things in his life. Being a motorcycle technician working in a motorcycle workshop day in, day out, he can run a motorcycle engine in the workshop for 20 minutes and stand next to it while he's working. But if that's a carburetor bike, he's choking his throat, his eyes are running within five minutes. So from that point of view, the environment is protected. That's what fuel injection's all about. Um, but I do think there's a crossover here because mm. you can put an air injection system on a carburetor bike and you can inject that bit of air into the exhaust. You can even put a, a form of cat converter yeah. in a carburetor yeah. bike and it will still run clean out the back. You can make carbs run. Also, these days, I've already been thinking in the long term future, junk those fuel injector bodies on the Triumph, put some FCR carbs on, junk the ECU, and just put a diner ignition on it. Yeah, I, I, I personally find carburetor engines nicer to ride. Yeah. There's something about the Christmas of the, res of the response. Yeah. Um, just the way the engine responds, I mm. prefer it. That said, um, fuel injected bike with something like a power commander set up correctly will Perfect. behave like a carburetor. Well, when, when we took the Triumph up after doing the exhaust, putting the open pipes on, there was a throttle lag just off tick over. You could feel it. There was a little hesitancy and then it would pull away. Once the guy remapped it, it's instant again. So, control wise, it's instant. If you've got it wrapped, mapped correctly and all set up properly, Fuel injection, to be honest, is the way. And, and to be honest, I think we've got a choice anyway, have we? I, I mean, no. It's the, the future the, the anyway. Cho the choice is gone. I mean, yeah. manufacturers need to meet tighter and tighter emissions controls, and they can't do it with carburetor yeah. engines. No, they can't. Not really. Not. No. In fact, they're they. struggling to do it with air-cooled engines. They are, absolutely, so yeah. Every, every bike will be water-cooled. Yeah, not not for long. Well, Harleys are going the same way. That's what M750s are all about. Uh, well, that yeah. was the second part of his question. Go on, then. Um, okay. He then went on to say, P.S., what's your opinion on the Harley's new Street 750? Right, I think, um, I think it's a fantastic bike, I've got to answer there straight away, I think they've done wonders with it and, and it's about bloody time <laughs> that Harley woke up, stopped making tractors and make something that, that is a wider market, Triumph. That's 20 subscribers gone. It indeed. Uh, you nearly got a waffle around your face <laughs> I there. Nearly did. Triumph, for years and years, have, have, when you look at their range, they've got the Bonneville range, which gives them that classic market, it gives them that respect. But they've also got the street triple, the speed triple, yeah. they've got the adventure bikes. Where's Harley? Why are not Harley Davidson stepping up? Because let's face it, Harley Davidson runs the motorcycle world. I don't care what you think, that is a fact. They are, they, if you look at them in the, in the stock markets, they're selling more units. You got some numbers in this the other day, wasn't it? How many bikes? 1.43 billion pound they're worth, I think. Something like that. They sold something like one and a half million bikes in the first quarter of last year. You know, they are selling more bikes than anyone else. They have the faith of people, they have the brand. And I think it's about time Harley started making other bikes, and maybe this is the way forward. They are inevitably going to go water-cooled. All Harleys will be water-cooled yep. 20 years from now. You can take that to the bank. The air-cooled engines, they will exist forever because they last forever. But when you look at it, you can still buy S&S engines, air-cooled retro stuff yep. to put in, retrofit stuff. But those bikes, I think it's a great idea. They're made for the Indian market. They're made for sort of East Euro oh, not East European, Far Eastern markets. Far East, yeah. um, and where people need smaller bikes to ride. And also, this brings you back to another point. Um, the sports that was invented in 1957 for smaller and lighter riders who want a bike that was going to compete on the track with the Triumphs. And that's what the Sportster was born for. And I'm surprised they haven't capitalised on the Sportster since 1957. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. Why haven't they made more bikes? They did it in Buell for a minute, but then for some bizarre reason, without any explanation, they put Buell to bed, and that's it, gone. Just when they made an engine that worked. Mm. Just when they put that nice 
European motor in I it. think he was too wacky for him, wasn't he? Well, I don't know. Maybe they've got other plans for him. They locked him back in the box for now, yeah. didn't they? But no, I think they're fantastic bikes. I think it's a fantastic move forward for Harley Davidson. I'm looking forward to see what they've got to come. But you, cool. would you like them? Would you like to try one out? Um, you into your hogs, baby. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not planning to change my bike for a little while. Cool. Can't afford it. Can't afford it. <laughs> no, I can't. Right, go on in. Um, I promised I'd get this question into you because it came in right last minute from right. Martin Harmon. Martin, hey mate. He's doing a caliper service. Cool. And uh, someone has tightened the head so much on the. There's a six mil Allen key bolt. Body bolt, yeah. Yeah, um, someone's tightened it so much the head's actually rounded off. How is he going to be removing the Allen rounded key out. bolts that have been rounded off? Right, it's just drill them out, isn't it? It's drill the head off, yeah. Drill the head off. All you got to do is take a six mil bit, a drill bit, which is the same size as the shaft that goes in. If you look at the Allen key that fits in, that Allen key will be the same size as the, the bolt shaft. So take a six mil drill bit and drill down the centre. Be very careful, drill in carefully until you, you'll see the head of the bolt will suddenly start to spin with the drill bit and then take it off. That's it, don't go any further, you've drilled the head off and then the two halves will come apart and you'll get a bit of stump poking up and you can take that out with grips. Yeah. That's it, simple as that. Drill the head off mate and sometimes that's all you've got to do. But be careful because it's, it's an alloy casting. You get stuck, just drop Yeah, get stuck, drop us a line. Um, We'll go from there. J.O. Trinidad Aye. says, how often to synchronise in two or four carbs, if possible with homemade kit? <laughs> we said this. Sorry. Yeah. Homemade kit, yeah. Using Grandad's colostomy bag and yeah. rubber hose. With Grandad still attached. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you might want a line filter for that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right, sorry. Sorry, mate. Um, how often? Well, as often as they need it. I've never done the Bandit in the 26,000 miles I've ridden it, and they do run a bit lumpy, but one thing that our good friend John Puckerpie discovered, yes. he spent about two days synchronising the carbs on his Bandit, and they run lovely, beautifully and smoothly. Two days later, yeah. Yeah. same. <laughs> Back to as they were, lumpy as hell. I don't think with carburetors, this brings us similar to our situation with the fuel injection. Carburetors, they're never balanced. They're really not. They'll always be a little bit out of balance. The best you can do is get them close. You balance them correctly, and that's fine, but they'll go out again within, especially if the bike's done a bit of mileage. So do them when they need it. Honestly, if it's running fine, ticking over okay, wouldn't yeah. you say? Yeah, I mean, if it's running really rough, really, really, really rough, then obviously it needs looking at, but. Yeah, we'll take a plug out, you soon see if it's running. Yeah, but, um, but for the most part, yeah. 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 Pro provided it will tick over and it will, you know, pull away and run. Yeah, that's it. Uh, next question, Sean Mullard. Uh, I'm not sure of your experience of bobbering motorcycles. Uh, wanted to bobber an oldish cruiser, not fussed on CC, but must be over 500. Uh, wondering if you could suggest a bike and any tips for bobbering a motorcycle. He's got a 1,500 pound price limit. All right, bad budget. Uh, have you got any ideas? Well, I think you can take away anything American. Um, you won't get hard for 50. You won't get anything for that kind of money. Well, we did actually. No, we saw Sean, didn't he? The local mechanic over here. He had an old 88 Sportster for 1500 quid. But you'll need, if that's your overall budget, you've blown it all on the donor. No, I'll tell you what, straight to mind for me, Dragstar 650. Yeah. I think they're fantastic. The Dragstar 650 almost lends itself to being bothered. You've got a big fat back wheel. You've got a lovely um, soft tail style cantilever back end. The shaft drive. The shaft, no, they're chained. Um, they're chain drive. The big ones are shaft drive. Yeah, so they're chained as well, which is pretty cool. And there's so much you can do to them. So the drag stars, drag star 1000 or drag star 1100. I mean, I would suggest anything with a steel frame. Man. You know, I mean, you, you don't want an extruded. Really you don't want an, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't want anything with an extruded any frame, do you? Because no, you can no. chop it about and do stuff to it. Well, it's got to be a cruiser, isn't it? Really. So it's got to be. It's got to be a yeah. cruiser to start with. You can't do it to a retro bike. Couldn't do it to oh, a trolley. No, no, because that becomes something like an old Honda Twin. Quite popular with, uh, particularly yeah. like the Japanese again. They yeah. love the old Honda, Honda Twins. They do, yeah. So, so anything really that's already a bit cruiser styly, that means you've got less work to do. Um, but for fifteen hundred quid, you've got loads of money there. You know, you can buy an old 650 Dragstar or something like that, or an early Virago 750 or something. A couple of weeks ago, you could have had a Sax Roast to 650. <laughs> you can't bother that, though, can you? Yeah, Brat style. <laughs> Brat style. <laughs> you can't bother anything. <laughs> got to be trying. <laughs> so, yeah, I reckon that, if it's me, I'd have a look for a Dragstar and see how you get on. And I reckon on your search, you'll find other options, so just go with the flow. Um, and if you get one or something that you fancy and you're not sure, drop us a line with a link and I'll have a look, give you an opinion mate, no problem.
and, and as to style, style it, just look at loads of photos, like I did yeah. when I did my green and white uh, Harley. Oh, Google videos, Google images, just isn't it? Just keep oh, looking I mean, at yeah, loads of great, pictures. Yeah. Yeah. I think you could try it's as well, great. when you look at some of the forums or you know the, the stuff you see, just put in drag star bobber and then Google images and you'll just get pages and yeah. pages. And there's so much inspiration there. When you look closely at what people have done, uh, you can nick, nick those things for yourself. That's what it's all about. Next one, Luke. Steve Sportster says, are you planning a ride up, or a ride up, a ride out, uh, meet up in the south of England, so your fans, <laughs> fans. Fans. What, both of them? We've got one down here. <laughs> this fan's keeping us warm in a minute. So, you're... so he's contributing the most. It's bloody freezing, isn't it? <laughs> Um, so your yeah. fans can uh, ride to meet you both. Cool. Well, all of us both. All three of us, yeah. Well, I'd um, say we're doing the bulldog. Make it in the summer, obviously. Ma so. Yeah, well, well, we're doing the bulldog bash this year, so um, you got your tickets already. Well, I have tickets have arrived. They, we've, we've sent off. We, he's got his ticket, no tent. We've got our tent, no tickets. Oh, I've got the tent now. He's got a tent. Oh, I'll tell you. We'll do it this morning. <laughs> yeah. So if you're interested, <laughs> the bulldog bash. I'll there for another day. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, August 7, 8, 9 and 10. Um, at Shakespeare County Race, race well, who doesn't know? Why am I advertising the beef? The Bulldog, it's the Bulldog! Who's coming? It's, <laughs> that's what it's about. We're going to the Bulldog because we think it's a fantastic opportunity to meet as many people as possible and have a great day out. Um, you don't have to come for the whole event. You can come just up for the day, it's not far. We're on the south coast. I think, I seem to remember, your, where is he? Does it say on there? No. I think in another mail, someone said there were bays and stuff. Well, I can't remember, but look, you know, it's only- It's only, even closer. Yeah, it's even for us. We're right on the south coast, down uh, near Paul and you're in Portsmouth, right? yeah. and it's it's literally an hour and a half ride to the Bulldog Bash. It's not far, so if you fancy meeting up, that's where we're going to be, and we hope to meet as many of you as possible. But fact, failing that, if people can't make that, we're always around in the summer. We're always around Dorset, Hampshire. Yeah. We're always bobbing around somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Maybe the old bit um, of Wiltshire. Yeah. So only if they let us in. Yeah. Remember the last time. Or if they let us out again. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, we're not we're not planning a, a ride out here specifically, but just all time, yeah. We we might do something. And as the summer progresses, I mean, there's no end of events that you know, yeah. we, we turn There's all sorts, yeah. yeah. We're yeah. In. Um, also, bike meets, places like Paul Key, uh, Sundays we go to there. Now and again, don't we? Yeah. We're, um, we're planning a Sunday lunch at Loomis, aren't we? At some indeed, point. yeah. Sunday lunch at Loomis. For those of some... you in the south of England, will know exactly where that is. Yeah, Loomis, the lady with the angry temper. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Jane, if you're watching. <laughs> then, oh, then... I'm in the shit now. <laughs> There was one last question, I think. Right, I've done all mine, thank you, for all the questions. What was the other one? Um, there was one for Dave, I know that you, you saw... I saw it, yeah. Just pop it on there. Let's, do you write it on? No, I, di I didn't write it down because I know you saw it. I think it was Alan Sims, wasn't it? Yeah. He said he wanted to ask, Mr Dyson, how did you initially invent the Twin Vortex vacuum system? Oh, right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, I stole it off the bloke with the same name that I'm no relation to. <laughs> He was right pissed about it, it still assumes your relation. Yeah. He went and socked and invented the ball barrow instead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just yeah. want to slip that one in. So how's that then? Are we done? We're done. We're done. Right, well there we are. That has been the first there was Garage Q&A. I think we've had some fun. We had some fun? I think so. We had some fun. We had, had some, some cake. Had some tea. Had some tea. And I only got waffled twice and you didn't get any. Uh, uh, I'm saving myself <laughs> yeah, but she knew, Yeah, but she knew she threw it you and you'd eat them. <laughs> <laughs> you got to eat them. <laughs> yeah, you got to eat them now. And she sat on them earlier. And they got your teeth marked in them. <laughs> <laughs> right, there we go. Thank you for thanks. all your questions. Yes, thanks for all your questions. Really it's been it. fantastic. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. We've had a great time. And I hope in all seriousness that we've managed to answer some of the questions that you've got. Always keep them coming and still, and we're going to collate any more from now on for the next one. So I don't know when the next one will be. We're going to probably leave it for a month or so. I should think so. And then we'll get the next Let one done. Let everybody recover. Let everybody recover and save up for some more tea and waffles. <laughs> Take it easy, ride safe, enjoy the summer as it's not coming short, is it? What have we got? Ooh. About two weeks and it'll be summer, <laughs> won't it? I thought it's started already, isn't it? It is. So we're going out for a ride now on the bikes and we're going to have a play. We're going to record some of that. So that'll be up later in the week. There. Take it easy, ride safe from me. Bye. Take care. Take it easy. See you later. Oh, bye.